What's up, guys? All 10 of you? I guess it's uh, tough competing with women at second lunch, so thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm James Landis. I'm not going to get too much into the arguments of authority fallacy here uh, and tell you too much about what I do, but uh, I'm the project leader for the OS periodic table of vulnerabilities, which is what you're all here to hear about today. Hopefully you're not in the wrong room. Uh, I do work for a fairly large company out on the West Coast, so uh, I do have some experience in, in, uh, in this kind of AppSec whack-a-mole that we've been playing. The uh, latest term now is AppSec janitorial work that we're all in, I think. Um, so hopefully this will be the last time I ever have to show this slide where we're continuing to play whack-a-mole with all these vulnerabilities out there. That's kind of the goal of this project is to take this strategy we've been dealing with vulns and uh, try to apply the lessons we learned from buffer overflow. So how many of you guys have seen a buffer overflow in the last 10 years? 10 years, really? Five years? Come on. Come on. In a web app phone? In a web app? No? All right. Uh, let's, let's answer that again. Web app phone, 10 years, last 10 years. Anyone seen it in a web app? All right, one. So um, does anyone think that we solved this problem with and I think a bunch of you probably are in Jira's talk just uh, 10 minutes ago, but anyone think we solved this with training or WAF or any other strategy? All right. So the idea is to take the lessons we learned from that buffer overflow vuln and build ourselves a whole graveyard of web app vulns and really just focus on the stuff that we can't kill easily with other strategies. So um, what the periodic table is, and I think you all have a copy of it, um, if you don't, uh, raise your hand and someone will either bring it over or you can grab it. But, um, and I'll go through it in, in a second. So that's kind of a, a teaser while I sit up here and talk about all the history that leads up to it. But uh, the idea behind it is, a, it's, yeah, it's another taxonomy. But this taxonomy is really all about figuring out how we can actually solve these problems as opposed to, and nothing against these, these taxonomies. These are great and they've served their purpose. You know, top 10 is probably the single biggest thing that, has brought people to the OS project, um, and you see it everywhere. So nothing against them, but they are sort of just enumeration of badness, uh, which, as we'll see, isn't the best strategy for solving these problems. Um, so what these, these, these classifications are, and I um, put that in air quotes because even the TCV2 isn't really a classification uh, so much as it is a list of bad things. And it is sort of organized roughly in order of how bad things are, um, but it's not very helpful when it goes to actually, comes to actually solving these problems. It, it's very useful for educating people about what the problems are, but uh, that only gets us so far to actually solving these things. So what are the, some of the things that we've tried uh, and failed to create the graveyard of vulnerabilities from? Uh, developer training, uh, again, if you guys were just in Jerry's talk, uh, he had started to gather some data about whether training actually works. And it sort of seems like maybe it does, but it really depends on how you do it and how often you deliver it. Um, but obviously, it hasn't resulted in world-saving, bug-killing, never seeing a vulnerability again in your life type of result. Uh, this idea of numerating badness, um, penetrate and patch, uh, these are some ideas. I think it's from a 10-year-old paper uh, that Marcus Rana put together about failed approaches to security in general. And this is just isn't web app sec, but it's, you know, it's a, a problem with the security in industry in general. Yes, we can do some of this stuff uh, with certain vulnerability classes. There are some things that are very easy to test for, things like CSERF, um, you know, HTTP response splitting. Some of those things are really easy to find and fix with testing processes. But other things like logic flaws, are very, very hard to solve those things, uh, except doing those things manually. And by the time we catch those, it's usually too late. Firewalls obviously haven't solved the problem. Um, talking here about traditional network firewalls, obviously, uh, if you're opening up 443 to let your traffic through, um, that's all you need as an attacker for web AppSec. Uh, nothing new or crazy there. But this also applies to even the WAFs we're using and, and uh, traditional IDS and IPS systems. Um, we haven't solved a lot of these problems with those technologies. And as you'll see later on, I'm not totally down on WAF. I think it's part of the overall solution. But it is only part of it, and it only works for certain volumes, certain volume classes. Uh, the idea of a root cause analysis uh, for trying to, to solve these issues. Again, we're kind of in a, in a navel-gazing academic kind of arena here. Uh, I've actually fallen victim to this myself. It's really cool the first time you realize that SQL injection and XSS are really the same fundamental thing. It's using data in a, in a context where it takes on func functional meaning. Awesome. Does that do us any good for solving those problems? No, not really. 
Um, so yeah, it's cool from a, you know, you can create a nice graph of how things are all related, um, but you're not going to solve XSS and SQL I with the same piece of code. So in the end, if you're a developer or your framework designer or somebody trying to solve this problem, making that realization doesn't help you. And also everything else we've been doing obviously hasn't worked. Otherwise, we would not be having this conference and none of us would have jobs. So, so how do we actually solve this problem? I'm getting to the periodic table, I promise. Um, the first thing we're going to do is accept the reality that HTTP really isn't stateless the way we're using it now. It is a stateless design protocol, um, but because we're trying to hack state on top of it, um, we run into a lot of problems because of that. So maybe we have to start accepting that reality and, and start building better state solutions uh, into the, the protocols and technologies we're building. And you know, I think this is something we all know now, but we do have to realize, and developers especially, um, need to realize that people will try to hurt us. Uh, most people aren't trained like we are. It's kind of second nature to, to think of uh, the world being a dangerous and terrible place because a lot of us do this for a living. I assume, uh, how many people are actually developers in the room? Few, okay. So that's good. Um, we're going to try to make sure you guys are as paranoid as the rest of us uh, by the end of today um, and the end of this conference. Uh, but it is important to realize that um, it is not a safe place uh, out there and while we're working to try to improve that for everybody, it's going to take a while. So the idea uh, behind this periodic table is that uh, there's sort of a continuum on how we're, we're solving these problems where the platforms and technologies and things that we're using are somewhere on the scale of, by default, when we deploy it, it's vulnerable, meaning like the platform itself will have vulnerabilities in it. Um, so we're starting off screwed, kind of. Um, and then on the far end, which is where we're trying to get to, is this idea of it's secure by design. Um, fails, closed, you know, all those particular, all those, you know, mantras about security, about uh, making sure that you can't make a mistake even by accident. That's kind of where we're trying to get to, and that's how buffer overflow was solved. You know, it's, you know, you can't introduce a vulnerability even if you don't know anything about buffer overflow because your platform is secure by design. So that, that is kind of one of the main driving principles behind the periodic table and how we're, we're getting to this idea of actually solving these things uh, without having to um, do better on all the other things that we've tried and failed with. Okay, um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the economies of scale and how we get that uh, with the periodic table approach later on. Um, but we don't want to end up in a situation where every single developer has to solve each one of these problems. So how do we divide this problem and conquer it? Um, so you see the categories here, and these correspond to the categories on your periodic table. Um, so on the bottom, you'll see the browsers and standards there. Uh, it's, again, when we talk about this metaphor, it, it's not a perfect metaphor, but in that, in that row where you have the lanthanides and actinides, we have the browsers and standard fixes. These are things that make it very difficult to even build a web app uh, securely in the first place just because the protocols that we're using, like I mentioned before, uh, make it very challenging to um, do things correctly or even safely. And sometimes uh, it's even impossible to do that where the browser vendors are making changes to their browsers, so this whole debacle with clickjacking, and you can kind of see how web developers were doing you know, frame-busting scripts, and then Microsoft came along and screwed everything up and made it possible to disable the frame-busting scripts, and then we had to build new standards, and so there's a lot of back and forth there. Uh, eventually, hopefully, we'll get to a point where we can settle on secure standards that actually make it easy to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, so you'll see that there's 12 vulnerabilities on the bottom there, uh, vulnerability classes, where we can get significant gains just by fixing the browser standards. And if we do that once, you know, that's a great example of economies of scale because that fixes the entire internet for everyone. And so that's the kind of uh, approach that we want to take with the rest of these is divide these things up, apply the solutions as close as possible to where they, they make the most difference. So examples of browser and standard changes, obviously user agents, that's the browsers there. Uh, the HTTP protocol itself could use a few tweaks. Uh, SSL and TLS, uh, obviously we've had beast attacks and problems like that over the years. Uh, that could use a few tweaks. CSP is going a long way to solving a lot of these problems for us um, independently of the code. Uh, there probably needs to be a few changes to the same origin policy, and I'll dig into that in a second as well. And then all the RFCs that, that the ITF drives uh, all of these new standards through uh, are obviously in scope there. Uh, any questions on any of this so far? I'm kind of running pretty quickly, but hopefully it's obvious. Any heckling? Everyone's still awake out there? All right. Perimeter and platform. Uh, again, we talked about uh, firewalls before, and 
we do think that there, there is a solution uh, design space that includes these perimeter technologies in how we solve web app problems. Again, uh, a lot of the mistakes people make is thinking that a WAF can solve everything for us. Um, you know, people kind of lump all of the challenges with WAFs into this bucket that makes it look like they are, are no good for us. But the reality is there's quite a lot of things that, that we can do, and it makes a lot of sense to knock off a lot of the stuff before it even hits the web app. Uh, so there's a lot of things we can do in these perimeter and platform technologies to help uh, get this result we want where these vulnerabilities no longer exist. So what we're talking there includes uh, application proxies, things like Squid, uh, people are using Apache as a reverse proxy. Uh, any CDNs out there, Akamai, um, CloudFront, all those things would be included in a perimeter technology. Uh, app firewalls, obviously mentioned, web servers themselves. And then we get into the platform technologies of you know, what you're, you're building your, your app on top of. So the database servers, app servers, uh, any operating systems you're building on top of. Those all play a part in what we end up with in the web appsec world as vulnerabilities. Um, you see on the OWASP top 10 this year, uh, the 2013 version, it talks about a lot of these things. Um, so how do we make the, the perimeter and platform technology that we're building on safer for web app development? Then we get into the frameworks. So does anyone think that there's a, a framework that you can build on right now that's secure? No one? Does anyone think that's a problem? <laughs> Only one of you, two of you think that's a problem, all right. Well, hopefully by the end of this, you'll all agree that the frameworks that we're building on are designed to be feature rich, but not security feature rich. So wouldn't it be great if, if the platforms we're building on actually solve a lot of these problems for us? So that's the, that's the key lesson I think we learned from Buffer Overflow is that how many of these vulnerabilities can we look at and say, you know what, I can solve that in the framework, make it secure by default, and the developer never has to worry about it, and I never have to teach them that? That would be an amazing result, right? So I make a little bit of a distinction here between a generic framework. Um, that would be something like uh, Struts or Ruby on Rails or something that everybody uses sort of the same way out of the box. And custom frameworks, which is when businesses take these things and then build new features on them or they build their own business logic into them, their own data objects, those kind of things. Um, both of those things together uh, uh, comprise what we think of as a framework uh, where a developer is actually writing on top of. So that custom code layer is, is where the rubber hits the road on this, and that's where we usually hit these problems is uh, when people are building code and have to think about these 53 or however many uh, things end up on the final version of the periodic table, uh, how many elements do you have to think about? If you're writing code, you know, I've, I've done a little web development in the last few months. I, I think I know this stuff, and yet still I'm making these, these mistakes vulnerability-wise because that's just too many things to keep in your head while you're trying to build functionality. So um, if I can't do it, and you know, maybe I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I think I know web AppSec. Um, there's certainly no chance of a developer who has never had any web AppSec training to come into an application framework and and actually build a secure app. So those categories all make sense? Fairly straightforward? Yeah, again, none of this is like totally groundbreaking or new, I think, but it's the way to look at this now, I think hopefully we can use it as a lens to look at this problem through in the industry and, and really make a go at tackling these problems in the right way. Um, you'll see a couple different um, sort of cones of whatever, cones of shame if you want to call them or what have you. Um, but you see how these things progress uh, along the, the continuum here. So the amount of mistakes a web developer, developer can make, if we're talking about in a browsers and standards fix, obviously most web developers are not changing browsers and standards, so that we can't possibly introduce mistakes if there's something that we've solved at that level, uh, versus the far end of the continuum where developer custom code is where most web developer mistakes happen. Um, so the, the closer we can get to browsers and standards in solving these problems, uh, the less likely it is we'll even introduce those, um, those classes of errors in the first place. Uh, that parallels very well the amount of impact that we can make by applying these solutions at these levels. So very little work comparatively to fix a browser standard or change some, some amount of technology. Obviously, it's not an insignificant amount, but if you can make a tweak to the browsers and standards, you can solve that problem for the entire Internet. Whereas if you try to solve a problem in custom code, and every developer has to solve that every day of their lives. Obviously not a huge amount of impact um, that an individual can make on that level. Uh, similarly, the amount of code changes you'd have to make to make these things happen, if you fix the browsers themselves, 
obviously a developer doesn't have to change a single line of code in order to get that benefit. And then the closer you get to um, that day-to-day -day work, obviously the more code you'd have to change. All make sense? Good? Not crazy so far? Okay, so what's the scope of this project? Um, the, the primary thing here is this, again, like we're not reinventing any wheels here. This isn't groundbreaking research. We're not showing you some new vulnerability that never existed before. All we're doing is taking the existing taxonomies, the existing sort of enumerations of badness, and putting them in a, in a view to show how these things can be solved most holistically on, along those timelines. Um, so you'll see on the periodic table that you actually have some of those vulnerabilities as you look closely will show up in multiple categories. Um, part of that idea is that we might need to solve those, those things with point solutions that exist in each of those categories. Part of it might just be, it's gonna take a long time to fix the browsers and standards, so in the meantime, we have to do this thing. So there's a couple different reasons why that'll happen. Uh, but the goal is, is described just enough of how that solution is distributed across each of these elements in order to um, to get the best value and, and get the best um, bang for your buck on these things. So all, of, all we're doing is referencing existing work here. That's obviously, the OWASP top 10 is, is a big part of that. Um, we also took in, like I mentioned before, the, the uh, CWE stuff, and it's not just the CWE 25. There's quite a bit of other stuff that relates uh, on the CWE, but we have at least the CWE 25, um, and then mix and match uh, other components where they overlapped with uh, the TCB2 and, and some of the existing OWASP documentation. So all we do is reference that. Uh, we're, not, we're not reproducing solution designs here or creating anything totally wildly new. Uh, we're just showing you a picture of how this looks if we're going to tackle this problem in the most effective way. So that said, there are a few things that we had to do that are somewhat new, like some of the browser standard work is somewhat her heretical at this point even, some of it might not even fly. Um, there might be a long runway on some of this stuff and convincing people that it's the right way to do. And then some of the stuff, like pushing things into perimeter and the framework may be a little bit heretical as well. But that's the goal of this project, is to get something out there, get the community working on this, seeing how it actually affects people in the real world that are trying to solve these problems in this way. And then we can move beyond the V1.0 that you have in your hands to an eventual solution that just becomes the way. Um, and then eventually we'll knock off that bottom 90% of vulnerabilities and developers will only be worrying about the top 10, uh, the real top 10%. Uh, we also excluded mobile right now and the tick client stuff. Um, and that can certainly be included in a later version. Uh, and it's certainly a lot of the things will apply to, to mobile technologies, but um, it, things that are especially on the client side themselves are definitely out of scope for this. And you know, as you move toward a more traditional MVC model, a lot of that stuff just falls out anyway, um, but that could be certainly something people might want to investigate for uh, another version of the table. Questions on scope? All good? All right. So the metaphor we're using here, obviously, is the, the periodic table of elements. Hopefully everyone's at least seen this. Now, maybe it's been 20 years since you were in high school and saw it, but uh, we're not going to belabor it too much other than the idea that we discovered something about the real world and represent that in the, in the periodic table of chemical elements. And we want to take that same metaphor and apply that to the space of vulnerabilities. Because if you look at a huge list of vulns, your, your brain kind of shuts down and it's like, well, how do I possibly tackle this? And OWASP top 10 is great for giving you at least, all right, focus on these 10 at first. And as you'll see, there's actually quite a bit more than 10 in the way it breaks out, but I'll get into that in a second. Um, but don't get too married to this idea of that there is some progression across the rows for what all these things mean and something across the columns. Um, so eventually maybe we'll get there, but the rest, rough organizational principles is more about the periods, right? So you have 1A, you could think of that 1A as being your frameworks and, and perimeter technologies. Um, o on the, on the far end could be your, um, your custom code, but within each of those periods, um, the most that we're having is some rough idea of these are the worst vulnerabilities, to work, the things to focus on, and then toward the bottom are the things that are less bad. But there's, even within that, there's not a, a lot of strict uh, determin determination about that because vulnerabilities don't m map directly to this idea of chemical elements in exactly the same way. But it is 
pretty good for government work, as I say. Uh, it gets you pretty close to the ideas that we're, that we're trying to get across here. So uh, these browser standards, um, the, the, the changes to the Internet standards concepts, kind of along the bottom, um, mostly because they, they represent a separate fixed strategy from what we're typically used to doing. Most companies are not in a position to fix the Internet. Now, there are very few that are, and they're certainly working to do that. Um, but most people, this is outside the scope of what you're capable of doing. So that's why it's kind of represented there at the bottom visually. Um, the rest of these technologies, again, there's not a lot of order as you go left to right um, in the table itself, other than the idea that the farther away from custom code you can get, the, the more value you get, the more bang for the buck you get, and the less te technology investment you likely have to make in order to solve that problem. Uh, you see there in gray, um, it might be harder to see on, on the printouts that you have, um, but hopefully you can see it on the table uh, up here. Anything that's highlighted in gray, you see on the legend there, is something that's in the OWASP uh, top 10 for 2013. And you may wonder why there's more than 10 there, and the answer is that many of those actually have multiple vulnerabilities all compressed into one. So the idea of session management, for instance, um, you know, that's A2, you have all kinds of things that roll up into that. Um, so yes, you want to solve sessions uh, holistically. You want to solve that problem holistically. Uh, but through this lens, you can kind of see how that takes components. And A2, you see um, very well represented here in the session management, this, all of this box, that's all A2. Uh, you've got A2 here in four or five vulnerabilities in perimeter and platform technologies. Um, and you'll see them spread throughout the, the generic framework solutions and custom framework solutions. So that's a problem where the solution is broken up across multiple of these categories. Um, but if we look at it through these lens, or through this lens, we have a much greater chance of our technology investment actually being applied most efficiently. All make sense? I see a lot of head nodding. Yep. Uh, yeah, sure. Now let me see. Let me, it's actually the next slide. Um, so the uh, idea of in input handling is there's some very generic data types that might exist out there. For instance, social security number, nobody has their own custom social security number data type. Um, and obviously email addresses, those kind of things. Those might be things where you'd have a validator in your, um, in your code, in your generic framework platform. So like, this would be something that could be put into Ruby on Rails or Struts or some generic framework that's out there. But then, as a business, you, you have your own data types. And it could be something about your customer that's unique. It could be you know, the products that you're selling have certain unique data types. And so the validation routines you would write for that would be layered on top of your existing framework solutions. And um, that, that's kind of how the division looks. It's anything that's custom framework is something that you can't, that, that's not universal to a, a particular industry. It's specific to a particular business. Um, but the difference between the custom framework and custom code is that you don't want day-to-day -day developers reinventing those, those same wheels. You want them building on top of a core foundation that is designed securely and then they can use safely. Does that division make sense? Okay. So uh, that's a good segue into the slide, actually. So I, I picked out a couple of examples here, and some of this stuff is going to be controversial at first. Uh, there's definitely a lot of argument especially about this idea in solving cross-site request forgery. And maybe cross-domain rights aren't such a good idea in the year 2013 and beyond. Um, there's a lot of resistance um, among browser vendors, among you know, people who are using the web the way it, it's working today. You know, what if tomorrow we stopped allowing cross-domain rights? What, how would that affect the web? Well, it would probably bring most things to a screaming halt. Um, a ton of of the ad network stuff is, is all built on this idea of allowing those, those cross-domain rights. Even if we allowed cross-domain jets and just eliminated posts, that's still going to break tons of the Internet. So how do we transition to a world where we're not doing all these things insecurely by default? Maybe there's no way to do that. Maybe we're stuck with just doing the way we've always solved CSRF, which is doing the, you know, the non-checking on any post or get requests. Um, you know, ideally not in get requests because you're not doing anything that actually changes application state, but we know how people like to break the standards on those things. Um, 
maybe we can't solve that in browsers and standards. Maybe that's too aspirational and we never get there. Uh, but at the very least, you see uh, you know, how these solutions often have multiple um, touch points in each of these columns. At the very least, you know, if we have generic frameworks automatically doing CSERF checking for us, then that's something a developer never has to worry about. Um, so that, that idea of pushing things away from custom code, how far can we get with nonce checking? Yeah, maybe you can do it in the perimeter or in the infrastructure um, by overlaying some proxy that injects these tokens. Maybe you could get away with that. But is that the right place for it? Probably not. It really is kind of specific to your application. And only your application you know, framework really knows whether something needs to be protected or not. Or, um, you know, there's a lot of nuance to those things, right? So clickjacking, again, we're pretty close to the solution on this one already. Um, we still have a little ways to go, I think, on the browsers and standards on defining how uh, we can do safe framing. Um, you know, I think the UI redress problem still exists for those edge cases where a website really does want to allow someone else to frame them, um, but wants to control how the UI elements look. I, I think that area still needs a lot of work, um, but XFO gets us most of the way there, at least preventing malicious actors and non-trusted third parties from framing us. So we actually are pretty close on this. The problem is that none of our frameworks do this stuff automatically for us or make it easy to configure. Um, you know, how great would it be that if we just have a policy file that says, here's all the sites that are allowed to frame me, and then the framework takes care of all the nuance to how you do um, you know, the, the host uh, option in XFO to allow that host to frame you. Okay, I've talked about input handling. Um, the last one there, you see there's some things that we just can't, we can never get away from teaching developers about. And in in those edge cases, and you see on the table, it's only about nine things. How great would it be if we can just focus on those nine things and developers never have to worry about the other 50 or 46 or however many it is? You know, that's the world that we're trying to get to uh, where the training can be focused and targeted. And you know, even if you're training people three times a year on just those nine things to, to get it to really stick, you know, that's only going to take a couple hours of their lives. It's not going to be, let's learn about XSS today, which, you know, I've, I've done training classes where you can spend a whole day on XSS and people still don't understand all the nuance to it. I still don't understand all the nuance to XSS. So if we can change this problem into something that's manageable, then we might have a real chance of, of actually fixing this stuff. Questions? You guys excited about this? It's never going to work? <laughs> well, I, I pay him, so he's, he's paid to be excited. But Okay, um, and I'll show you the, all this content on the OWASP site in a second, but um, just to dig into that idea of XSS a little bit, um, there are nuances to this, right? It's not it's just as simple as saying, okay, let's solve XSS and framework and we're done. Um, not that easy. You know, if, especially if we're talking about older applications we're trying to ref, retrofit this stuff to. And I'll talk about that as well later on with some of the, the challenges we have with this approach. Um, but very hard in a framework, and, and Google's done some great work on automatic like context detection and all those kind of things, so it's not impossible to retrofit this on an app that is doing the presentation uh, intermixed with uh, the business logic. Uh, much easier with you know web 2.0 or 3.0, whatever you want to call it, where the services layer is decoupled from your actual presentation. Um, and that's the direction I think we all need to be pushing the industry to go is continue to enforce that hard separation between presentation and, and uh, your actual application. But it's, unless you're living in that model, it's very tough. And even then, you still have to worry about DOM XSS, so whatever your, um, you know, your client framework looks like still has to be worried about how that, those, those data are marked up. And it doesn't work for very specific edge cases where your content is already markup. So if you're running a site where people need to upload their own HTML or JavaScript or whatever that is, and you want to allow certain tags um, to be embedded by untrusted parties, then you have a fairly complicated problem. Again, it's, it's solvable, but this isn't as easy as XSS in framework check. And part of the challenge is that one of the ways to get people onto a framework is make it very easier feature-wise for people to build a web app very quickly. And this idea of limiting what is actually allowed to be served up really kind of goes against that idea of get a developer on a framework developing code very quickly. Because developers know HTML. They know how to 
um, you know, create a document in, in the frameworks they've already been using, if you've got to force them on through the steep learning curve of how do I actually get content onto a page, uh, it's much more challenging to get uh, content adoption onto a framework, which is probably one of the main reasons why we don't have XSS solved in any framework yet. Um, but you know, if you look at the amount of money you have to invest to play whack-a-mole with XSS bugs versus you know, getting developers ramped up on a platform that is safe for them, I think it's fairly clear what the right answer is. So we just have to, as a group, you know, show that, that comparison of here is how much it costs you to build on an insecure framework, and here's how much it costs you to not. Um, and I think that those numbers will start to come out as we actually have frameworks to measure against. Um, and I think it's going to come down very clear, clearly on this, this side of having secure frameworks. Uh, but again, right now, the numbers, uh, again, if you guys saw Jer's talk, it looks like people who are self-reporting on having secure platforms to build on, they don't actually um, see the improvements yet on a you know, breach percentage perspective. So I, I think there is some nuance to that. I think we need to dig into that data a little more because I think the right answer really is solving these things in framework. I mean, if you ask those folks, you know, how many of you had buffer overflow vulnerabilities compared to the framework solution for buffer overflow? I think the answer would be clear. The question is, how do we divide up that answer? So the things that we think need to be solved in frameworks, we're actually measuring those directly and seeing what the results are. So some of this is a little theoretical now, and part of this is for you guys all to go out and take these concepts and see if they work in the real world, uh, which is something that uh, my team is doing and, and my company is doing. Um, but we are, we're not doing it officially under, under this guise. We're, we're doing this idea of building solutions into frameworks, um, but I don't, I don't think we're at the point yet where we're seeing the problem in that light, which is where I'd like us to get to. Okay. Um, so the last point here on, on uh, sandboxing is we're getting close to having some browser capabilities and solutions on XSS, which may actually help us avoid even doing the uh, solutions for these things in the code itself. We might be able to get away with um, some perimeter technologies that put a nice CSP on there that say, all right, now I don't have to worry about cross-site scripting because my policy is uh, preventing it. You know, some of the Kaha approach might work if you actually need to allow third-party JavaScript. Uh, so some of these things exist. Um, the new iframe definition uh, around the, the sandbox uh, tag on an iframe might actually get us most of the way there for some of the stuff we're trying to do. Um, but again, it's the edge cases that are challenging, and that's where we're really going to have to focus our investment on this challenge to understand if this is something that's even possible. And my guess is that for most enterprise applications, this isn't a problem. Um, but we'll find out when we actually go try it. So one of the beautiful things about this is we, and I mentioned this before, we can go from a long list, laundry list of things that we had to teach developers, which they have no chance of ever remembering, to this very short list of things that um, are more conceptual even and not even, you know, having to specifically remember, you know, what is the particular line of code I have to write to solve this problem? It's more, more principle based and things that tend to stick in people's minds better. So I think that's a beautiful result. Um, not perfect though. So one of the challenges, and I didn't, I think I mentioned this before, but the idea of the existing infrastructure that we're stuck with right now, it's very hard to retrofit a lot of this stuff onto what we already have. Um, and so we have this big hill to get over where we need new frameworks to be secure, but we don't have any examples of those, and it's very hard to rebuild our applications on top of those. So um, we'll have to, I think, by volume, we'll have to see is it easy to get this thing into a framework or not. Um, and it, well, there'll be a bit of an exploratory process there as we try to tackle this problem. But it's certainly, there's going to be a large class of these things where we're going to be stuck with, you know, what we had, and it, this doesn't help us solve that problem. Uh, but I don't think that's an argument against it. Um, a lot of the, you know, technologists these days want to build on the latest and greatest technologies anyway. Um, so by the time that we're ready for them, you know, it may be time to start migrating some of these legacy apps over to the new safe technologies anyway. Uh, another thing that doesn't help with is remediation planning or any gap analysis in existing apps. Uh, there might be a way to start looking at this stuff through the lens. So I can envision a scenario where you throw the periodic table up on a board and you color in the things that you've already solved in your application versus the things that you still need to solve in your app. 
Um, and you can see if they meet that criterion of, is this solved in my framework in a way that developers can't make a mistake? And that's an important distinction. Yeah, it's great if you have, you know, there's, there's all these tools out there to, that will help you do these things. Um, but if you have to remember to do them, most likely you're still going to have problems versus, you know, if something like um, the OWASP Enterprise uh, frameworks and the output encoding stuff was automatically integrated into your framework, then the developer wouldn't have to remember it. You're much more likely to succeed there. Okay. Um, so again, I talked about this idea of uh, applying this in, in a way that gives you the greatest force multiplier. The, the most amount of benefit for the least amount of work, um, you know, that's the magic argument for most business and risk management conversations. Uh, but I think it makes sense for us as an industry to uh, tackle this problem in that way. So the last idea here uh, is it does allow us to objectively evaluate these technologies that we're looking at. So yeah, a WASP might have everything, you know, kitchen sink-wise when they, when they bring their presentation in. And I'm, again, I'm not totally against WASP. I think it has a perfect place uh, in the end solution. But it allows us to measure, and there's already the, the WAFEC project out there. If you, have you guys seen WAFEC, the web app firewall evaluation criteria? So p perhaps we could steer with WAFEC so that the top 10 items on WAFEC are, you know, the, the 10 things on the, the left side of the table that really need to be solved in perimeter. And I think a lot of them are there, um, but certain things about brute, brute forcing and, and some of this automatic remediation might need to get there. But we can measure our firewalls on do they solve this problem for us. We can measure Akamai and, and the um, content distribution networks. Do they solve this problem for us? Then we can start measuring our frameworks. And this doesn't exist yet, um, but there is a project starting. Uh, Michael Coates is working on a web application framework evaluation criteria project slash frame, framework security project. So can these criteria drive what things need to go into frameworks? Can we have a numerical system for measuring how well does this framework do on each of these scales? And you can take that argument to your architects and your development managers and your product managers and say, you want to use this framework? Great. Here's all the million things you're going to have to do in order to make that framework secure. Oh, and by the way, here's this other framework you may have never heard of, and it may be a little of investment for your developers to learn it. But at the end of the day, what's going to cost you more? And that, that conversation gets much easier to have if you have those numbers there. Um, so that, that, I think, is going to be a great result of this. I mean, by itself, the periodic table is sort of an academic document. But I think it can drive a lot of the work that we're doing toward real objective um, principles and, and uh, quantitative analysis of the technologies we're using to build web apps. Right. Well, um, it's going to be a tough argument because you, you can't argue with $40 billion of investment for the ad networks who want all those features, right? So um, I, don't know, I don't know what the answer is going to be to that problem uh, other than possibly making sure they at least have the capability and then you know, we can do education as website owners and as corporate citizens to say, here's how you need to browse our site. You know, those are... Those are some of the things that we can do to kind of combat that, but I don't think we're going to come up with $40 billion as a security industry to argue against the features that are driving, you know, the, the anti-security features in things like Chrome and Firefox that make their living on how easy is it for advertisers to make money on the platform. Uh, my team, meaning the project team or the company I work for? Um, so, yes, and I don't want to talk too much about the latter uh, on what we're doing on HTTP 2.0, but um, what, what's the, what's the driving force behind that question, I guess? Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of the ideas in the periodic table around session management, especially when it comes to browser uh, changes, um, a lot of those are what those standards bodies are already working on. You know, things like tying a session ID to an, H or an SSL session, for instance. Um, capabilities for um, managing credentials more carefully. There's even stuff in HTML5, apparently, that will allow you to do state management on the client a, a lot more safely than the existing broken cookies hack that we've been dealing with for 15 years. Um, so the, the generic answer to the question of is HTTP 2.0 the right venue for solving these? I think, yes, it's part of that, but it's not the only the only venue. And, and the idea behind the periodic table is to focus the things that we really want those standards groups to address. Um, and as you can see right now, it's only 12 out of 50, which isn't bad. And a lot of those changes are already almost there. Um, but, it, but it allows us to, to go after that problem in a much more focused way and then leave all the other aspects of that that we can solve ourselves and actually do kind of make sense to solve ourselves. It lets us focus on those independently. If that makes sense. So uh, real quick, let me show you guys uh, where all these resources are. So if you just uh, Google for uh, the OS periodic table, yeah, it's the first link there. And the, the site layout may be a little bit confusing, um, but you see along the top here you have uh, site navigation for this entire page. And it's all one page, and we're going to work on making this uh, a lot easier of a resource when you first come to it. Uh, maybe the first thing you see should actually be the periodic table, those kind of things. But uh, this gives you a pretty good background. Uh, there's a bunch of different views of this data. Uh, so this particular view kind of shows you each of these line item by line item and how the solutions break up uh, across the board there. Uh, but what you might really be interested in is the release formats tab there. And that has uh, not only what you have in your hands there, uh, which is the very bottom here, the contact, compact view. Um, but we're going to be working on a poster size view that maybe we can start posting. You know, people can have that up in their dev shops to see how these things break out. Um, just a great resource, I think, for people to gain awareness about vulnerabilities, kind of see how they, they play into the solution space. Um, there's the interactive view which when you guys look at this table, obviously you see an arbitrary definition of what these, these things are. And I'm not married to what the, the element symbols are. This was just a convenient shorthand. I don't really care about that. Um, but it does allow us to uh, basically show that in a very concise way on a very small table uh, so that eventually you'll start to get a sense of where these things fall in the solution space. And then this, this view actually, uh, you see how it's hosted on GitHub. Uh, the OS site doesn't let me put custom JavaScript out there. Uh, maybe that's a problem I'll be able to solve. But um, basically, you can mouse over each one of these and see what the vulnerability is, some brief detail about what the root cause is, and then where the solution space needs to go. And then when you click on one of these, it takes you to the actual page where you can see all the details of what the, the standard solution needs to be, where, the, where things need to be solved in framework, um, what needs to be custom code. And then if there's any discussion or controversy, which part of the idea was, was uh, we kind of did a soft launch of this this summer, uh, but this is almost sort of the official launch of this project here at OWASP uh, 2013. Come back and tell us, does this, this stuff work for you? Is it crazy? Is it, are your developers telling you you're nuts? Are you a developer and thinking this is nuts and not going to work? Um, we want this thing to really represent the state of the industry and and be a useful resource for driving how we're tackling this problem. Um, it is, like I said, it's sort of academic, but uh, we want as quickly as possible to make this something that is usable. Um, one of our next steps is going to be taking a look at this and, and saying, how can we create a view of the periodic table that's right for each a member of the audience? So what does a developer want to see when they look at the periodic table? What does a WAF vendor want to see? What does a framework designer want to see? What does a security architect want to see. All of those different views, there might be ways of, of changing this lens a little bit so that the ideas make perfect sense to whoever is looking at them um, and we have a much better chance of succeeding. Now you see the references here. Uh, all, these, all these bugs will have, and you see on your periodic table as well, anywhere there's an existing CWE, OWASP top 10, or a TCB2 entry, uh, you'll see the link to that uh, right on the periodic table itself. 
And all of those links are mirrored here as well. And then on the back of your uh, sheet there, you'll see the legend that explains what each vulnerability is. Again, it lists what all those mappings are. And a lot of these you know, don't map exactly to one vulnerability exclusively. Um, some of them, especially on the CWE stuff, have multiple things that map in. Again, the, the argument isn't to say this, this is how we want to think about or this is how we want to represent the vulnerability space. Uh, I'm not as married to that as this is how we actually solve those vulnerabilities and that's why we have things in the periods that we have them in. Okay, so I've left, I guess, only have a few minutes for questions, but is this crazy? You think it'll work? It won't work? Who's going to go try this? Okay. Okay. Uh, who has ideas for, if you're not going to try this, how to make it something you can actually implement somewhere? Anyone? No? Still processing? All right, well, that's, that's the great thing about OWASP is this, this is a resource everybody can use. Uh, we wanted to make, make it as universal as possible. So if it doesn't look like something you can use yet or if it looks like it's something that's totally crazy, um, absolutely join the project. Very easy to jump on the mailing list, uh, see what we've talked about, look at the archives uh, so far, contribute, change it, make it, what, make it yours, make it, make it what you want it to be. Um, this is a resource for you guys. I'm going to give away drink tokens for people to ask questions. Anything? Bueller? Go for it. Right. Okay. Any, is there a question in there? Yeah, yeah, I think the visual representation is great. All right, that, that counts. All right, there's your drink. <laughs> right? Uh, so the question is, uh, now that we have the table, is the next step an outreach program? Uh, I think it is. And like I mentioned, we want to use this to drive a lot of other OWASP projects and shape them, where... WAFEC already exists. Can we use this data to change WAFEC in some way? Um, there's a, another framework evaluation project that's being built. Can we drive that? So I'd like this to be a core informational resource um, that drives other projects. Um, but certainly one of the things we want to do along the, the lines of making it educational is build some tools that allow people to go evangelize with this. So you can take it and it's, uh, take your 20-minute presentation to your company and present that at some hackathon somewhere, or um, take it to your local OWASP chapter and present it. Like all those resources, I think, are part of this project. And anyone who wants to help out with that, uh, absolutely, you're welcome to. Do I need to go to the stage here, or am I good sitting around asking questions? I assume you guys will come and pull me off if I, you have to. But. All right, two more tokens. Anyone? You guys drank too much last night, or you just <laughs> ran out of material? Okay, well, thank you guys.